Hello, everyone. This is your endocrine and integumentary dysfunction voiceover. This slide just shows the different endocrine organs within the body and what they control. So you can take a look at that at your leisure. Endocrine dysfunction. The endocrine portion of the lecture will cover pituitary disorders, diabetes, type 1, and sex chromosome abnormalities. Pituitary disorders can be caused by a tumor, infection, abnormal fetal development, birth trauma, and even genetic syndromes. It can occur, though, with no obvious cause, and we consider those to be idiopathic. We can see one hormone affected or many hormones affected. It really just depends. The clinical manifestations of your patient will be dependent upon uh, the hormone that is being affected by the disorder. Um, and we can see either an overproduction or an underproduction of hormones. With a growth hormone deficiency, we see a diminished or deficient secretion of growth hormone. Along with that, we see an inability to metabolize protein, fat, and carbohydrates. It affects linear growth, bone density, and growth of body tissues. So sometimes we associate it more with just height issues, but it really affects overall growth. So um, how well or how quickly they fill out, not just how they grow in height. So we see delayed linear growth, skeletal and sexual maturation that is behind their peers. Um, and these changes are going to occur later than usual, but will appear in normal sequence and manner. So even though it starts later, eventually that growth and development will occur. For diagnosis, we look at family history. We look at the individual growth patterns and health history for that child, do a general physical exam, and a skeletal survey. This will allow us to look at bone age and determine um, when, uh, you know, how well the bones have been growing and um, how long they have yet to grow. We also do endocrine studies in the form of growth hormone testing. Uh, what we do is give two medications um, at different times to stimulate growth hormone, and then we do blood work in set intervals after the medication to see if they're secreting the amount of growth hormone expected. Um, we do two different medications because insurance um, only is willing to pay for growth hormone replacement, which is very expensive, if they have two tests to confirm that the growth hormone deficiency is indeed there. We also will do a CT or an MRI to evaluate for, a, for the presence of a tumor and rule that out. Treatment of growth hormone deficiency is really directed at the correcting the underlying cause. So if it's a tumor, we're going to take out the tumor. If it's a problem with the pituitary, we're going to treat that. If it's a problem with the organ that's producing, um, you know, whatever the hormone is, it's, you know, we're going to look at uh, what specifically we can do for that hormone. In this case, it would be growth hormone. A replacement of growth hormone is uh, successful in about 80% of children that are affected, which is good. Um, it's typically going to be a sub-Q injection that's given weekly. And then the, uh, you know, the dosage or the amount of growth hormone given increases as we get closer to the time of the epiphysis closure. And then we will end therapy when the child is tall enough, when you know, we determine that point, or when growth slows to less than one inch per year, or when their bone age indicates that the growth period is ending.
nursing management for growth hormone deficiency is focused on promoting growth. Um, so we look at, we want to make sure we're identifying growth problems, evaluating growth charts effectively, um, and identifying kids who um, need to be evaluated. We as nurses are going to be existing with the diagnosis. We perform the growth hormone testing and um, in the hospital. Um, at, you know, really, it's just a little outpatient admission. They're there for only a few hours. We also are going to um, be monitoring their growth every three to six months. So we're going to track growth um, in height, and we're going to look at weight gain and, um, and muscle mass and things like that. We also want to do what we can to enhance the child's self-esteem. So we want to encourage them to express feelings. Maybe they're, you know, feeling inadequate because they're short, you know, what, whatever it is. We want to kind of support that and encourage um, them to talk about their feelings. Maybe get them in touch with support groups um, so they can get to know other kids, in most cases teenagers, that are going through the same thing. And lots of, lots of family education. So we want to make sure that the family has the support it needs. Um, and, you know, connecting them to resources. We want to educate them on the, uh, on the growth hormone testing, um, what kind of medications we give, how they will function in the body, what to expect, and potential side effects. And then in some cases, we may get a dietitian involved so that they can talk to the family about how to get enough calories, how to get the right types of food calories, and things like that. In precocious puberty, we see children who are manifesting signs of sexual development before the normal age of pubertal onset. So we consider puberty to be precocious if we see it before age 9 in boys and age 8 in girls. It is more commonly seen in girls. Um, and what happens with precocious puberty is there, you know, we have an activation of the hypothalamic uh, pituitary gonadal axis and the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. So to simplify that just a little bit, for whatever reason, the pituitary sends the message to the gonads that say, hey, it's time to start making those um, sex hormones, so get to work on that. So it releases uh, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And then uh, for boys, we're gonna see uh, a, a testosterone increase as a result, and girls will see an increase in estrogen. When precocious puberty occurs, it, it essentially is going to lead to the premature uh, development of pubic hair and breast buds. And if untreated, it will progress to the point where, um, for girls, they get their period and become fertile. We may see these kids uh, complaining of mood swings, headaches, acne, and body odor. All of these things are going to arise um, from circulating hormones in the body. Rapid growth is also going to be stimulated, so children um, start uh, to have that pre-adolescent growth spurt, so they may appear to be taller than their peers. We want to remind parents that their dress and activity should be appropriate to their chronological age, not based on their body shape or body type. The sexual interest is not there. These, these children, although their bodies are developing, developmentally and psychologically, they are the their um, their numeric age, so their actual age. So they're not interested in having sex at age eight at all. Um, and we're going to mainly do, uh, do education. We want to talk to parents about the expected physical changes, coping, um, what kind of medications and how we're going to administer them, and just kind of prepare them overall for, for the course of treatment to expect. For treatment of precocious puberty, the child will receive gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GNRH um, is what it's abbreviated as, um, and these injections are given to regulate the pituitary secretions. It can be dosed in um, a couple different ways. So we can do a sub-Q injection daily, an intranasal compound that's given every um, like two or three times a day, uh, a depot injection, which is kind of 
a slow release injection every three or four weeks or every three months, um, or it can be given as a subcutaneous implant, and that would be done annually. Um, the medroxyprogesterone injections um, can also be given, uh, we can do tablets as well, can be given to prevent periods from starting. So if that's a concern, we can do that. And then treatment with these medications is going to be discontinued at an appropriate chronological age, and puberty will then kick in and progress according to you know, normal expected growth and development. Each year, 18,000 children and adolescents are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus, and 5,000 are diagnosed each year with type 2. So we used to not even discuss type 2 diabetes in teenagers and would you know, really only consider type 1 to be appropriate in pediatrics. But more and more children are being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes than ever before. And this, um, we believe, is attributed to the increased rates of obesity, decreased physical activity, the increased exposure to diabetes in utero, with your gestational diabetic moms, and um, a higher rate of type 2 diabetes is seen in Native American, Hispanic, and African American children. So because of all of these changes, we're seeing more and more type 2 diabetes than we used to, which is very concerning. Type 1 diabetes is characterized by autoimmune uh, destruction of beta cells. And of course, those beta cells are, are, are responsible for the production and release of insulin. So ultimately, it leads to absolute insulin deficiency. Typical onset for type 1 diabetes is in childhood and adolescence, but really this can occur at any age. Most of the diabetes that we see in childhood is type 1, and it is more, more prominent in Caucasians. And a quick review for type 2 diabetes. Um, type 2 diabetes arises because of insulin resistance. So it's not that the body can't make insulin, but it's more that the insulin that we have can't do its job. So we're, you know, the body is resistant to insulin um, getting in there and helping to process sugar. So it's increasingly common, of course, in adolescents, especially um, those who have, who have established some very poor eating habits. Um, Affected people with type 2 diabetes may require insulin injections, but sometimes can be managed with diet, exercise, and even oral medication. Just a quick review on the patho of diabetes. Um, what we have with diabetes is if, you know, whether there's a deficiency of insulin or, or resistance to insulin, Basically, the glucose is unable to enter the cell. So the glucose is there in the bloodstream. We just ate a meal or whatever it is, and the sugar has been released. The problem is we can't get the sugar into the cell. So just to make it very simple for you, if you're not familiar, the way I always teach our new onset diabetics at the hospital is that if you think of um, the cell as having a lock, a door with a lock on it, and the only way that sugar can get through that door past that lock um, and into the cell is with a key. And that key that, they use, that the sugar is going to use to get into the cell is insulin. So without that key to the door to get past that lock, sugar is stuck outside the cell. It absolutely cannot get in there. So once we add insulin, we provide that to the patient, then that key is unlocked, the door is opened, and the sugar can then make its way into the cell, providing energy for our cells to function. That's you know, diabetes at the most basic level of understanding. So what also happens within the pathophysiology, this is short and sweet, but um, because we have this buildup of sugar in the blood, in the serum, uh, the serum glucose is going to exceed what the kidneys are able to process. And so the glucose, as a result, spills into the urine. That's why we test, uh, sh you know, uh, you know, test the urine for sugar on our diabetic patients. 
then as a result of those things is your cell is, it is essentially starving. It doesn't have the energy, the sugar that it needs to function. So the cell is starving and it sends a signal, uh, signal to your body that says, hey, I'm starving here, help me. So then your body says, hey, this body needs some sugar. And so what it does is it begins to break down a protein and uh, you know convert that to sugar. And this takes place in the liver. And so it will break down protein, turn it into sugar, you know, in the hopes that the body will be able to use it. Diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, occurs when our, um, our diabetic patients begin to use fat instead of glucose for energy. This can happen for a number of reasons. Uh, and we, we don't need to get into the nitty gritty, but we usually see DKA in patients who are not managing their diabetes correctly. It can be done intentionally or unintentionally. Um, so, so essentially what happens is they're going to present to us with a decreased appetite, nausea, vomiting, and lethargy. So just kind of a general not looking good, um, not feeling good, low energy. Um, it, it may not start out really obvious. Um, one of the things that we will see early on is a urine test that is positive for ketones. So that's something we want to be on the lookout for. Um, they will progressively deteriorate without treatment. Um, they may initially start with signs of dehydration. That will progress to electrolyte imbalance, which will progress to acidosis. So we're looking for things like the Kussmaul breathing, a fruity acetone breath, things like that. They can progress to the point where they... Um, go into a coma and die. So this is considered a medical emergency. It is very, very scary. They need to be admitted to the PICU so they can be managed and watched very closely. And just kind of as a side note, you will see a, a DKA in teens with eating disorders at times. So what they'll do is intentionally go into ketosis um, so that they won't be as hungry, so they can lose weight and burn fat and, um, you know, depriving their body of sugar, um, they think is a great way to lose a few pounds, but it's also extremely dangerous. So just be on the lookout for those in DKA. We want to evaluate um, their mental state and rule out an eating disorder as contributing factor. Treatment for type 1 diabetes is insulin therapy. When we're dealing with children, we have to remember that they're going to learn very quickly how to manage their own illness, and they're going to be able to learn to give their own injections, check their own sugars, and really be very involved in their own care. We rotate sites with children the same as we do with adults, um, and remember that the fastest absorption for insulin is going to occur in the abdomen. We dose the insulin based on the child's uh, carbohydrate intake and their blood glucose levels. So rather than um, relying on sliding scales like we do with adults, we manage them slightly different and we'll talk about that more in a couple of slides. For glucose monitoring, the goal is to keep them near the normal levels. We ideally want to keep them you know, between like 70 and 110 um, for their blood sugar level and we also use the A1C as a guide. Um, as well in children. So, and you're used to seeing that with adults already. Here you can see this child who's a school ager, um, he, he was perfectly able to give his own injection and check his own blood sugar. Management of type 1 diabetes includes uh, correct nutrition. So we want meals and snacks that are eaten according to the total calories that are needed for a child of that age and size. We, um, we want to make sure they're getting enough exercise. We don't restrict exercise. In fact, we want to encourage it. But we want to um, make sure they know how to manage, um, you know, manage their diabetes along with exercise, making sure they get snacks before exercise, etc. And lots of teaching. Um, on how to recognize signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and how to manage those episodes. More on that in a moment. We want to talk to them about illness management. 
um, and that it's important to continue checking sugar and giving insulin, even though they're, they may not be eating normally. And then the management of um, diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA, um, and that it's considered an emergency and they need to bring them into the hospital. And again, and we'll have more on that in a moment as well. With our new onset diabetics, especially our, um, our focus while they're in the hospital is going to be on teaching them about diabetes and how to manage their diabetes and use insulin. We're going to teach them the nature of diabetes and the pathophysiology. So what's happening within the body? We need to explain to them that a cell needs sugar for energy and that um, think, think about each cell as having a locked door. And so uh, insulin is the key to unlocking that door to allow the sugar into the cell. And that if we don't have insulin, that door stays locked. We can't get the sugar into the cell to provide energy. So that's kind of a simple way for us to explain it um, to younger children um, and to parents. So they get that beginning understanding of what the heck is the problem in diabetes and why do we have to use insulin? We talked to them about meal planning and choosing the appropriate types of carbs um, and complex carbs and trying to minimize uh, simple sugars and things that we know are going to have a high glycemic index. We're going to teach them how to count carbs and about the carbohydrate ratio. So um, the, the carb counting essentially um, is how we're going to determine how much insulin they need after a meal. So um, each child to sign a carbohydrate ratio or an insulin to carb ratio or carb to insulin ratio, however you want to say it. So let's say a child is given a ratio of 15 to 1. That number is based entirely on their specific insulin sensitivity. So each child gets their own insulin ratio, okay, or um, carb to insulin ratio. So we'll say that the child is given a 15 to 1. So that means for every 15 grams of carbohydrates they consume, they're going to receive one unit of insulin. So for example, if a child consumes a 60 grams of carbs in a meal, they would receive four units of insulin to cover for that meal. Now, one thing to keep in mind is let's say the child consumed 85 grams of carbs and at that same same carb ratio of 15 to 1, um, when we do the math, it tells me on the calculator that, that they should be getting 5.66 uh, units of insulin. So, and as you're used to seeing um, in the adult population, we give units of insulin in whole numbers. You can't give a half or a quarter units. You would round up. On an adult, 5.66 would round up to six units, right? You're just going to give them the six units. Um, but with kids, we want to be very cautious in rounding up. We want to be very careful. So we actually are going to round to the nearest one half unit rather than whole units. And you can see in the picture here, um, it's showing you actually what the markings on the insulin syringe will look like. So on the right is like the insulin syringe that you're used to seeing, although you're probably used to seeing 50 or 100 unit syringes. So this is a 30 unit syringe on the right, and you can see that the markings are in one unit increment. And then on the left is what we use in pediatrics. So it's still a 30 unit syringe, but rather than having one unit increments, you've got one unit increments, and then on the left, you have half unit increments. So we can actually give one half unit of insulin. So if our math tells us to give 5.66, 0.66 is actually closer to the half than the whole. So we're not going to round that up to six units. We're going to round that to 5.5 units of insulin. Hopefully that makes sense. And we'll talk about this in class a little bit more um, just to make sure that everybody understands it. Um, and then there are two types of insulin primarily that we're going to use with children. We're going to use the short acting or regular insulin and our long-acting insulin, an example of that would be Lantus. We don't give the rapid acting all that often, um, and I can tell you I've never given NPH um, to a child in my career as a nurse. Not that you would never use it, but it's just not used very frequently. So we primarily are going to use our regular insulin that will be given for coverage um, for meals and for correction of high blood sugar. And then our long acting will be given just before bed based on their bedtime blood sugar, and that will give them that um, low uh, basal dose of insulin throughout the day. We need to teach them how to mix insulin if necessary, how to administer insulin um, in each type, how we rotate injection sites and all of that. We also will do teaching about an insulin pump if they're a candidate for that. Most of our slightly older children, definitely uh, by the teen years, they're old enough to use insulin pumps. Um, it allows kids to 
live a more normal life, um, not have to pull out um, so much stuff to check their sugar and give shots and all that. They can just do it all in their pump. It can check their sugar and then they can tell it how much insulin they should get after their meal and it will just infuse for them. So that's nice allowing uh, teenagers especially to manage their diabetes a little more subtly um, and not having to make a big deal about it. Just a quick note on blood sugar monitoring. Um, you guys should all know how to do this, but just as a refresher, um, you're just gonna clean the finger with some warm water. We don't use alcohol. You wanna make sure that the finger is clean because in some of uh, the previous studies that I've seen, if you've just eaten something that's full of carbohydrates, grease and sugar, things like that, anything that um, is gonna impact your blood, if it's on the surfaces of the fingers, when you go and poke the finger and get that drop of blood, it's gonna be contaminated with whatever was on the skin surface. So you wanna make sure that the skin is clean. We wanna use the ring or thumb finger are usually um, the best choices because the blood flow is a little better to these two fingers. So, um, and then you puncture um, just to the side of the finger pad. So not the side of the finger, but the side of the finger pad. So think of where your fingerprint is on the pad of the finger and you're just gonna go kind of off to the side of that. You don't wanna push it too hard and make sure that you have the depth uh, adjusted appropriately if um, your uh, needle is adjustable. So, and in pediatrics, you'll generally see uh, the variable depth ones because you're not going to go as deep on a two year old as you're going to go on a 12 year old. There's going to be a significant difference in depth. So, you don't need to go too deep. If you go too deep, you're going to cause some bruising and more discomfort, which is really, you know, can be avoided. It's unnecessary. And then we really tend to use the you know, monitors that require the least amount of blood with children so that one, we don't have to poke as deep so we can use um, a smaller gauge and a shorter needle and we don't have to squeeze as much blood out of those kids and it's a little less traumatic for their bodies. And in the next two slides, you're just gonna see some pictures of a, a, of a child who isn't very old. He looks to me to be around eight years old maybe and he, he's able to do his own finger stick with a little bit of supervision and assistance. So many of the kids, once they're diagnosed and they've had a tiny bit of exposure to diabetes and begun to see how we manage it, they can take over much of the management on their own. Here we have another school ager who's learning to check their own blood sugar, so has a little supervision, um, looks like a healthcare provider that's sitting there with them, but is teaching him how to check his own sugar. And again, um, the child is able to put, put his blood sample into the monitor and run the monitor with a little supervision. So you certainly don't want to leave a child so independent that they're managing their diabetes completely independently, but you want to let them do and touch and have a little bit of control as long as they're appropriately supervised. Teaching for the child and family with diabetes includes on the recognition and treatment of hypo and hyperglycemia. For hypoglycemia, we need to teach them um, that the child will feel shaky, maybe dizzy, a labile or irritable, a nervousness, maybe even weepy. Um, we'll, ha we'll have them take either some orange juice or some sugar cubes and then follow that up with complex carbohydrates and protein. One of the best examples um, of complex carbs and protein um, for diabetics would be like an apple and peanut butter. It's kind of like the perfect snack. The complex carbohydrate of the sh uh, of the apple is going to be a sugar that is digested slowly, and although it will bring up the blood sugar, it will not allow the crash, and the protein will help to minimize crash as well. And then for hyperglycemia, again, they'll be lethargic, confused, um, may even appear drunk at times. Um, so you know, obviously a child with this type of behavior would be, you know, really obvious. So, but we want parents to be able to recognize these signs and symptoms. We want to teach them how to manage minor illness um, and how to keep records and when and what to report 
to um, to their endocrinologist um, how to clean um, their skin before testing, clean the skin before injections, how um, to draw up their insulin using aseptic technique, and to do everything um, in the safest way possible. And then we want to provide some family support. It can be really scary to parents who are bringing in their three-year-old um, and getting a, a diagnosis uh, um, of diabetes. That's pretty, um, you know, pretty heavy stuff. It's going to be a lifelong condition that they have to learn to live with and can be extremely overwhelming. So we have to do a good job with teaching parents and providing them the support that they need and really just you know, letting them know that life isn't over. The two sex chromosome abnormalities we'll be discussing are Turner syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome. Turner syndrome affects girls only, and Klinefelter syndrome affects only boys. Um, a little trick that a former student shared with me um, for remembering which one is which, so this may or may not help you. If you like it, run with it, and if not, um, feel free to just ignore me. Um, so for Turner syndrome, since that affects girls, it might be helpful to think, helpful to think of Tina Turner, famous singer, you know, Ike and Tina, um, and then she had a bunch of hits in the 80s, if you know who she is. Um, the, and for Kleinfelter, um, Kevin Klein, if you happen to know who he is, he is an actor. Um, I've got some pictures in here that you can see who they are, if maybe you know who they are but didn't know their names. But Kevin Klein is a boy, Tina Turner is a girl. So that might help you to remember that Turner Syndrome is girls and Kleinfelter is boys. With Turner syndrome, we see an absence of one of the X chromosomes. Um, it affects females, and the incidence is 1 in 2,500 male births. The manifestations of Turner syndrome include the following. At birth, we'll see a webbed neck, shield-shaped chest, widely spaced nipples, low posterior hairline, and low set ears. At puberty, we'll um, notice that these girls are short in stature, uh, and display sexual infantilism, meaning we've delayed puberty or no development of secondary sex characteristics, and amenorrhea, meaning they don't get their periods. Um, they may have some learning disability and social skill difficulty, but they don't have an intellectual disability. Um, so they're of normal intelligence. And they usually are infertile. So we say usually, so they, as a general rule, are infertile. However, it, is, it has been noted um, that some of these girls with Turner syndrome have been able to get pregnant. So won't say it's impossible, but it's definitely not very likely. Treatment for girls with Turner syndrome include hormone therapy, um, which would include growth hormone and estrogen, and we're going to provide them with counseling. These um, these girls, uh, as you know, we know that they're going to be infertile, so we want to make sure that they know what to expect, that they've been able to deal with that eventuality, and help parents come to terms with that, because that can be, you know, quite devastating for some. And then in this picture below here, you can see the webbed neck and the low set ears. Um, you can't see all the features, but you can definitely, um, I feel like even on the picture of the right, you can kind of sh see or note a shield-shaped chest. Um, it's kind of wide across. Um, so it might not be super obvious, but that combined with the other, um, you know, the other signs, and you might be able to pick up on that. Kleinfelter syndrome is the most common of all chromosome abnormalities. The incidence is 1 in 500 to 1,000 male births. And with Kleinfelter, we have a presence of one or more additional X chromosome, um, the most common presentation being XXY. It does occur in males, and it's rarely seen before puberty. It's also associated with tall stature. In addition, 
we see defective development of secondary sex characteristics. So they will have no sperm in their semen, small testes. Um, they won't um, develop those normal body changes, the growth spur, um, the bulking up in muscle, voice changes, all of that will not be as pronounced. Um, they may not be diagnosed, though, until they seek treatment for infertility. Um, they also will present with cognitive impairment of varying degrees. Um, you'll see things such as motor delays, speech or language difficulties, attention deficits, and learning disabilities. Sometimes these kids can be labeled as having behavioral problems, that type of thing. Um, so they definitely can fall through the cracks until um, you know they're trying to get their wives pregnant. Um, so counseling is also important. If we know this um, beforehand, we want to make sure that they have the opportunity um, to talk about their feelings re uh, regarding um, infertility and talk to them about what other options may be available to them in the future. And um, this is going to be treated. We can treat some of the symptoms, the physical symptoms uh, with testosterone. That will help them bulk up muscle, have voice changes, all of the things that we associate with boys um, who are going through puberty. That may help. This next section will focus on integumentary dysfunction. Pediatric skin variations for the infant include skin that is thinner and has less subcutaneous fat, um, allowing substances to be more easily absorbed. So anything topical will be absorbed very easily. They are less resistant to bacteria getting through skin because it's thinner. They're more susceptible to blistering and skin breakdown. Their skin is less pigmented. They have a, um, a decreased amount of sweat. They're not efficient at sweating. This equates to a decreased ability to regulate their body temperature. Um, their skin thickness and characteristics will reach adult levels by the late teen years, but it's a slow, gradual process. Okay, so uh, we just talked about some of the communicable disease stuff and the rashes that come along with that. But sometimes we can have um, you know, significant wounds that occur as a result of something that's infectious or contagious. So just to kind of do a little refresher with you, remember the factors that are going to influence how the skin is going to be able to heal. So for improved healing, we want a moist, uh, crust-free environment. That is really going to improve you know, the healing abilities of the skin, from you know, whether it be a wound or a rash where the skin is broken open, whatever it is. Uh, we know that poor wound healing is going to occur with people who have um, a nutritional deficiency. Specifically, those that we're very concerned about are vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C, uh, low protein, and low zinc. So those who aren't getting enough of those things in their diet are not going to heal as well. Stress is a huge factor in wound healing. So those who have a higher level of stress will have um, an increase in the release of catecholamines um, that cause uh, vasoconstriction, and that reduces the blood flow to areas that are in need of healing and slows the healing process. Infection, of course, if we have um, a wound or an incision or something like that, if it becomes infected, of course, that's going to um, you impact the body's ability to heal, it's going to increase the inflammation and increase the risk for tissue damage in that area of the body. There are many uh, disease processes that uh, you know, impact uh, wound healing. As you already know, uh, diabetes is one of those. Um, anemia, you know, peripheral vascular disease, uh, and uremia, all of those you know, conditions are going to decrease the body's ability to heal um, or extend the length of time it's going to take for them to heal. I mean, circulation is important. So anything that's going to influence or reduce uh, the circulation to the body is going to impact the ability to heal. That um, you know, directly results in a reduced supply of nutrients um, at the cellular level, and then those cells cannot heal as well.
We also want to remember what types of symptoms that we're going to have on our patients um, who have a skin condition of some type, you know, communicable disease, wound, all of that. As the skin heals, um, it's very common that our you know, patients are going to complain of itching. Kids are especially sensitive you know, to itchiness when it occurs and really, really likely to scratch. So we want to think about that and provide interventions that are going to reduce the opportunity for the child to scratch those itches. Um, so we can provide them with uh, cool baths or compresses that sometimes will help with comfort. Uh, baking soda baths or with some conditions an oatmeal bath might be appropriate. Those will make the skin less irritated. We really need to prevent scratching. So for the younger children, we can put them in little mittens. If you've ever had a newborn baby with long fingernails, you know, we put little socks or mittens on their hands to prevent scratching by accident. But especially when they're itchy, the kids are going to scratch intentionally because they want to make the itch stop. So the mittens work great. Um, it also is helpful to keep the short, or, I'm sorry, to keep the fingernails short and clean so that one, they can't do a lot of damage if they do scratch, and two, if they are able to scratch, they're less likely to introduce germs to the area. But think about how poorly kids do at hand washing at a young age and how difficult it's going to be for them to resist the urge to scratch. And we really need to keep that in mind um, when we're caring for children who are itchy. Um, and again, so the anti-itching medications can be very helpful. So the topical or oral can be helpful. Um, they may present also with pain. It may be more than itching. They may actually have pain. So it wouldn't be inappropriate to provide them with some Tylenol or ibuprofen for that mild to moderate pain. For infections of the skin, we're going to talk about bacterial infections um, and fungal infections. And we'll get into the specifics in just a moment. The important thing to remember that the severity of skin infections varies based on the patient's skin integrity, immune, and cellular defenses. Impetigo is a bacterial infection. It is very, very contagious. It is caused by staph or strep. Um, I associate most commonly with strep, but it definitely can be, um, can be caused by staph as well. It's very common in the toddler and the preschooler age group. Um, it's very likely to uh, get into the skin through an area um, where the skin is just broken, um, like an insect bite, scrape, or something like that. Most of the time, the lesions with impetigo are located on the face, arms, and legs. Um, it itches intensely and is definitely more common in humid weather. Um, impetigo uh, contagiosa is one of the most common bacterial infections we see in children. It is extremely contagious. Um, so if you think about it for just a minute about bacterial infections that are extremely contagious, which two age groups do you think are going to be more likely to spread this type of bacteria? You guessed it. It's most common in your toddlers and your preschooler ages. Um, they're the ones that are less compliant with hand washing and tend to be really good at sharing germs. Um, so we see an impetigo infection. Um, it can occur anywhere where the skin is broken. Um, it can be something as simple as a scrape, scratch, or insect bite, allowing that bacteria to get into the skin and cause a nasty infection. Uh, the impetigo lesions are, mo are, are mostly located on the face, arms, and legs, and one of the hallmarks is intense itching. It can be spread from one area to the other um, on the child's body by self-inoculation. So let's say they have it next to their nose. They can scratch at it and end up like scratching their arm and self-inoculate um, on their arm, and now they have it in two locations. Um, so one of the tricks that we've learned is to keep the fingernails short on a child who has something that is itchy so they're less likely to break the skin open and or spread the infection. Um, we want to teach good hand washing. Hand washing is mandatory when you're caring for a child with impetigo. Really, really important. We want to make sure that the child with impetigo has, uh, is provided with separate towels and washcloths from the rest of the family. Uh, PJs 
um, should be separate from everyone else's. They need to be changed daily and, and washed with hot water and soap. Um, we can also treat um, impetigo with topical and, um, and systemic antibiotics. Oh, and I forgot to mention it is more common um, in humid weather. So we don't see a whole lot of impetigo when the weather is very dry. It, it tends to like moist weather. Here you can see a good example of what impetigo contagioso looks like. It's obviously around the nose area. Um, and you can see scabs that have collected there. And then you see some areas that are kind of raw and open looking. And so those raw areas can get a little oozy um, and goopy. And then that um, fluid that kind of like, like oozes out will cause scabs. So we actually want to kind of keep the scabs off. You want to keep it cleaned off and prevent lots of scabs from forming so that it can heal nicely. And the scabs will actually inhibit the healing a little bit. We can also see fungal infections on the skin. Um, so a fungal infection is a superficial infection on the, on the surface of the skin. Um, it's transmitted uh, from person to person or it can be transmitted from an infected animal to a person. So examples of this would be um, your candidiasis or thrush yeast infection, uh, tinea capitis, which is ringworm of the scalp, and tinea uh, corporis, which is ringworm of the body. Um, it, it also includes athlete's foot, your tinea pedis, but we aren't going to talk about that specifically. So we'll talk about the thrush and the, and the two types of ringworm. This picture shows um, a candidiasis or yeast infection in the diaper area. And when you compare this to the diaper dermatitis um, I showed you before, um, you can see that where it's really angry, where uh, the infection or when the where the fungus is um, is more focused, you see a lot of redness. Um, but initially when it started, it looked more like these areas with the little red dots and spots. And what's happened is this, uh, this fungal infection is so severe that those little dots and reddened areas all have run together to create one large reddened area. But where the other diaper dermatitis, the edges um, of the infection were very clear, well, uh, or, the, or the irritated area, not infection, were very clearly marked. Here you have some clear lines, but then outside of those lines you have a lot of little satellite areas uh, or lesions where you see red dots all over the place, and that is where the fungal infection is spreading its way across the skin. So that is the main difference between when you're seeing a fungal infection versus just a straight-up diaper dermatitis uh, from irritation. Ringworm is a fungus. It has uh, strong filaments that invade the hair, nails, and outer layer of the skin. Uh, tinea capitis and corporis are what we're going to be focusing on here. So remember the capitis is the ringworm of the scalp and the corporis is ringworm on the skin elsewhere on the body. We really want to teach kids about good hygiene. We don't want them to share scarves and hats um, for the capitis and um, can, uh, it's a good idea to inspect family pets who may be carriers of ringworm. Um, we want to be aware of like seats with headrest, bus seats, uh, helmets that may be shared, and mats inside the gym. Um, I can tell you that one of my kids contracted ringworm at a gymnastics birthday party at a gym, and he ended up with, I want to say we had about 26 spots of ringworm um, all over his body, um, but we were able to treat it only with topical. So we can use um, oral, uh, oral antifungals or topical antifungals or uh, a selenium shampoos for a ringworm of the scalp can be very effective. Um, and I'll show you pictures here in a moment. Here you can see a couple different presentations um, of ringworm. So on the upper left and the bottom right, so they're kind of catty, catty corner from each other, you can see a couple presentations of ringworm. Of course, one on the cheek there, and then some. The other picture shows them on the, like the upper arm and shoulder. 
Um, and then the other two pictures, A in the lower left corner and then the upper right hand corner, show ringworm of the scalp. So the one on the left bottom, that one is kind of messy and gross looking. It looks really raw. Um, the one on the right, you can see where there's a loss of hair, but the skin doesn't look quite so icky. So it gives you an idea of a, of a couple different presentations you can see there for ringworm of the scalp. Okay, so now we're going to talk about dermatitis. Um, so more than half of, um, uh, of the skin problems in children are forms of dermatitis. Um, and with dermatitis, we see um, a sequence of inflammatory changes in the skin. Um, the location and manner of these reactions will produce uh, different types of lesions. Um, on the upside, uh, the changes um, that we see with dermatitis are usually reversible, and usually the skin will recover without any blemish. Specifically, diaper dermatitis is seen very often in children. Um, it's usually caused uh, from the irritation of urine and feces on the skin um, or from uh, detergents, soaps, and things that are not rinsed well enough from clothing. and can also be caused uh, by chemical irritation like uh, diaper wipes or the chemicals in the manufacturing of diapers and things like that. Um, some things to consider from a nursing standpoint is that anything that like will alter the level of wetness of the skin, that will alter the pH, and any type of fecal irritant is going to be especially harsh on the skin and could potentially cause the diaper dermatitis. Now this picture is an excellent example of what a diaper dermatitis looks like. What you'll notice is that one, it's very red and irritated. Um, the skin looks really angry. Um, and then the edges of the dermatitis um, are very clearly defined. So essentially wherever the irritant touched the skin is where you see the redness and inflammation. So it's not like an infection that's going to spread whatever part of the skin was touched by the irritant is the area that's affected and nothing beyond that. So all those edges there are probably where the edges of the diaper, at least on the thighs, where the edges of the diaper allowed the skin to be exposed. Um, and then everything that's not red was probably outside of the diaper area. Atopic dermatitis or eczema, you've heard lots about. Um, it is a type um, of pruritic eczema um, that begins in infancy. So um, we know that there is a hereditary tendency um, to getting eczema. It, it does tend to run in families. It is often associated with history of food allergies, um, allergic rhinitis, and asthma. There are three forms of eczema. Uh, there's infantile eczema, which we see beginning between two and six months of age, uh, childhood eczema uh, between ages two and three, and then there's a pre-adolescent and adolescent type of eczema that affects those from ages 12 to early adult. And each one has slightly different look to it um, and different uh, characteristics. Here you can see an example of what your infantile eczema looks like. It um, is very oozy and crusty. We tend to see it a lot on the cheeks. So infantile eczema is usually described as red um, with vesicles or papules that tend to be weeping or oozing and have areas where they've begun to crust uh, you know, crust over, and then usually around the edges, the skin seems um, somewhat scaly. We tend to see it on the cheeks, scalp, trunk, and extremities. Then the child or adolescent uh, eczema tends to be um, red or flesh colored, um, and what we see there is papules or scaly dry patches. Um, so it just has kind of a different look to it. We see it we tend to see it in the flexural areas, so wrist, ankles, feet, face, and neck are kind of the most common, but you can see it in other places as well.
Therapeutic management um, of eczema includes skin hydration, a relief of itching, a reduction of inflammation, and we want to prevent or control secondary infection. So if we already have secondary infection, obviously we don't want it to worsen. Um, or if we have no infection yet, we want to prevent that. Um, and the best way to do that is, pre is to prevent kids from scratching um, wherever they're feeling itchy. So some of the strategies for prevention would be avoiding any irritants or allergens that we know is, uh, is going to lead to a, um, an eczema exacerbation. Um, we can treat with antihistamines. Uh, topical steroids may be effective. Very mild soaps, if any soap at all. And emollient creams will help um, to, keep the, uh, to keep the skin well hydrated and moisturized. Soft cotton clothing will provide them with more comfort. And mild laundry detergents are less likely to irritate the skin. Uh, pediculosis uh, capitis is the medical term for head lice, um, and I know you're all going to start to scratch and itch now as we're talking about this. Um, it is extremely common, especially in school-aged children. The most common uh, symptom that we see with head lice is itching, so they'll um, be very itchy and scratch their heads a lot. The adult louse lives for only 48 hours without a human host, and the female louse has a lifespan of about 30 days. The females will lay eggs or nits at the base of the hair shaft. Then within about 7 to 10 days, those nits will hatch, and those little baby lice will um, crawl up the, um, the hair shaft to the scalp where they will feed. And they feed on... Um, on human blood, so they'll get a nice little meal there and then they'll start the cycle all over again. We treat uh, head lice um, with pediculocides like NYX or one of those, um, I think RID is another one, but there are all different um, brands of uh, treatments for head lice. Um, and then the daily removal of NYX. So we're going to shampoo with the pediculocide and then we're going to actually have to pick out the NYX. Um, by hand and inspecting the hair shaft um, every single day to get rid of them. Here you can see the live lice actually um, sticking um, to the hair shaft there. So this is highly magnified. They're actually quite small, about the size of a grain of rice. Um, so um, they're pretty easy to spot. Here they, I feel like they kind of blend in with the hair, but it's usually not too difficult to spot them when you're checking for them. And then the nits will actually look like kind of a silvery white, yellow, or even a darker uh, teardrop shaped um, stuck to one side of the hair shaft. And, and you'll see a picture of a knit in just a moment. Here you can see on the left is an empty knit case. It's more of a clear type of a color because the knit has already um, hatched out of it. And then on the right here, you can see the viable knits are actually inside the knit casing um, still. So they have a bit more of a solid uh, like color and look to it. Preventing the spread and recurrence is extremely important. We want to do a really good job um, in, in um, like inspecting at schools. And if anyone um, um, is known to have lice, we're going to check that entire classroom and the classrooms of any siblings of that child who was diagnosed with lice. We do lots and lots and lots of teaching. It's important to understand that anyone can get it. It is not something that affects only those who are poor or are dirty. In fact, they actually don't like hair that is oily. So they are really like very clean, straight, fine hair. Um, so they're going to stick better and like that hair. If there's a little bit of oil on it, it's not going to be as easy for them to adhere. Um, so the cleaner the hair, the more they like it. In fact, it's most likely found in Caucasian children, which um, tends to be girls more often than boys, and they like straight hair. Um, it is transmitted by the sharing of personal items like combs, hair ornaments, and scarves, um, or kids who are playing very closely together where they're rubbing heads. We see this a lot more with girls. 
Uh, children can return to school after they've received treatment, and um, we have identified that they are no longer um, infested with lice. We teach parents to wash all washable items in hot water, dry clean anything that can't be washed, um, vacuum the entire house and furniture as thoroughly as possible to pick up any, um, any nets or any lice that may have um, inadvertently gotten left on furniture, and we soak combs and brushes um, in hot soapy water to clean them. Uh, scabies is caused by the scabies mite um, and what happens here is the female actually burrows into the epidermis uh, where they deposit their eggs and feces. Um, this leads to inflammation of the skin um, that occurs about a month to two months after the initial um, uh, burrowing into the skin. Um, so it actually will leave either reddish or grayish tracks on the skin um, where they're working um, through the epidermis there. Um, we treat with, uh, with topical treatments, um, and there's a couple different medications that we use. You don't have to try to memorize the medications. I, I will not ask you about those. Um, and we can also use uh, a systemic treatment. So um, we can give oral medication if they weigh at least 15 kilos. Here you can see what the what the scabies mite looks like, um, and you can see the skin where the mite has burrowed into the skin, and you can see what that looks like. Um, it, uh, it causes kind of a rash, an itchy feeling, and a crawly feeling is what people will describe. They very much like areas like the genitals, armpits, waistline, hands, and breasts, um, where um, those are kind of, you know, the happy locations on the body for them. And it's spread through physical contact. So we have to have skin-to-skin -skin, uh, contact. So hands are a really good place for them to kind of get started on their journey. On the next few slides, we're going to talk about burns. Um, you get some basic burn information in your critical care lectures. And I'm going to talk really just specifically about burns in the pediatric patient. More than 120,000 burn injuries are treated each year in children. Um, burns also account for 20% of abuse injuries. Um, a burn with 10% or more of the total body surface area can be life-threatening. And there are four types of burns that we see. The majority of burns are thermal. These would include those from flame, hot surfaces, hot liquids, um, like scald injuries, that type of thing. Um, we also see electrical injury, chemical burns, and radioactive burns. Radioactive would include like sunburns um, and the like. Um, depth um, of the burns are um, expressed, they used to be expressed in degrees, first degree, second degree, third degree. But now we talk about them as superficial, partial thickness, deep partial thickness, and full thickness. So it gives you um, a little bit better idea of how deep um, the burn has, uh, you know, has penetrated. In these illustrations, you can see um, examples one, two, and three. Example one is superficial. Example two shows a partial thickness. And um, the example three is full thickness. So you can kind of see the progression there and the depth of the damage based on the burn injury. And I'll show you some pictures on the next slide. Over on the left would be a superficial burn. The top right-hand photo um, of the ankle, that is a partial thickness burn. And the one on the lower right-hand corner, um, that would be a full thickness burn. So you can kind of see, um, hopefully get an idea of the level of damage that you'll see which each um, burn depth.
The types of burns that we see by age group um, are as follows. So on the infant, we tend to see a lot of thermal injury, uh, scalding liquids, and house fires. Uh, uh, with our toddlers, we see still a lot of thermal injury. Uh, uh, thermal injuries like pulling hot liquids or grease onto themselves. Um, electrical burns can result from biting electrical cords. Chemical burns from ingesting cleaning agents and other chemicals. In our preschoolers, we, we see a lot of thermal, like scalding and hot appliances. On the school ager, we tend to still see thermal, but it's usually from things like playing with matches, fireworks, um, electrical injuries come like from climbing trees where they may be too close to high voltage wires. Um, and chemical burns like combustion experiments. And in the adolescence, we see thermal, chemical, and electrical burns um, and radiation burns because we see a lot more uh, sunbathing um, in this age group. This is what a scald injury looks like, which is the most common in infancy. It can happen from, um, from falling into a bathtub that's too hot, being placed in a bathtub that's too hot, or getting a hold of hot liquids. Here's a burn injury on the mouth uh, from biting an electrical cord where the current um, is actually arcs through the lips, calling a um, uh, uh, causing a full thickness injury. Burn injuries lead to intense vasoconstriction. Um, that leads to ischemia um, that may increase the depth of injury. Um, and when that happens, uh, vasoactive hormones are released, and this actually increases the capillary permeability. After this happens, we see a fluid and plasma shift to the interstitial space, leading to edema and decreased fluid in the vascular space. Um, it's going to take 18 to 36 hours for the capillary permeability to normalize after a burn injury. Um, the, uh, the child's going to lose increased heat and water through the injured epidermis. And we also see an increased metabolic rate and, um, and calories uh, needed to maintain body temperature and begin healing. So there's kind of a lot going on in burn injury. Um, they're at risk um, for going into shock after we see those fluid shifts and decreased fluid in the vascular space. So we kind of really have to be on the lookout um, for those types of complications. Major burns are going to be treated in a specialized burn center. These would be any burns uh, covering more than 10% of body surface area, any full thickness burns, burns on the hands, face, ears, the genitalia, and feet, which tend to be much more painful, any electrical burns, and any inhalation injuries. Your moderate burns can be treated at a hospital that has the ability to provide burn care, and any mild burns can be treated on an outpatient basis. Now the extent of injury is going to be expressed in children by a percent of total body surface area. We do not use the rule of nines in children like we do with adults. Total body surface area affected is going to be based on the child's age, the area of the body that's been affected by the burn injury, and whether the burned area is a partial thickness or full thickness burn. So um, you can see the chart here gives you an example. You look at the part of the body that's burned and then find, find the column appropriate for their age, and that will give you a percentage. And then you're going to add um, for certain areas if you have a partial thickness and um, full thickness, and that will give you your total percentage of the area burned. We, um, as I said in the previous slide, we don't use the rule of nines. Uh, complications from burn injury um, include your uh, airway compromise. So we really, um, we always are going to have our airway and breathing um, and circulation as our first priority. Your ABCs are really, really important here. Shock is a risk sepsis. Um, lower age means we have a higher mortality rate. So the younger the patient, um, the greater their mortality risk is. 
um, and lots of pulmonary problems um, as a complication from burn injuries. They're at risk for aspiration pneumonia, pulmonary insufficiency, um, atelectasis, and ARDS. And we also see a lot of wound sepsis. So if we don't do a good job with our wound care, um, we can see um, lots of complications with wounds and infections. Nursing management for burn patients include uh, promotion of oxygenation and ventilation. So we're going to monitor their respiratory status, administer oxygen as needed. We want to restore and maintain fluid volume. We can do this by monitoring the eyes and O's um, and administering IV fluids as needed. Lactated ringers, or LR, is the fluid of choice for burn patients. We're going to calculate that volume based on the total body surface area that's been burned. And then half of the total fluid is going to be given over the first eight hours, and the remainder of that volume will be given evenly over the next 16 hours. So ultimately, um, that'll help us determine the amount of fluid they need in that first uh, 24 hours. In addition to this amount of fluid, we'll be giving them the normal amount of maintenance fluid that they would need anyway just to maintain. We'll also monitor their cardiac status and their electrolytes. We'll try to prevent hypothermia by warming those IV fluids. Um, we're going to cleanse the burn. Um, the rule of thumb is mild soap, cool water, and to cleanse very gently. You don't need um, to scrub really hard, you want to be very gentle, you don't want to cause any additional tissue damage. Uh, we want to prevent infection. This will be done by making sure their tetanus vaccine is up to date. Um, might be applying antibiotic ointment to their burn wound, uh, membrane dressings. Um, you might see uh, like the biosynthetics and hydrocolloids. Um, antibiotic impregnated dressings, all of those are options for wound dressings. And then uh, their nutrition, we want to make sure they're getting a high calorie, high protein diet so that they can heal and um, fight off infection. In addition to that, we're going to be managing their pain. Um, that may be done through the use of sedatives and analgesics, depending on where the burn injury is, how much pain they're in, all of that will be factors in, in determining exactly how we're going to manage their pain. And we also want to assess for abuse. Unfortunately, we do see uh, child abuse, burn injuries, and um, it never gets any easier. So we always have to be thinking when we see these injuries um, is how did that happen and does the story that I'm getting from the parents about the injury Makes sense. Does it match what I'm seeing in this injury? And if it doesn't, it definitely needs to be reported. Here you can see a child um, who, who had a scald injury um, being treated uh, with Aquacel dressing, which is a silver embedded dressing. And you can actually see uh, the exudate um, through the dressing that has been absorbed um, and is visible. Here you can see um, an injury that is related to child abuse, and you'll see another one on the next slide. Um, this is actually um, what we call um, a dip injury. So this child was... Um, put in some type of hot liquid, probably hot water, and they were actually lowered into the water feet first. And so the reason why we know this is a dip, uh, dip injury related to child abuse rather than an accident is that one, both feet are burned. So if you have a toddler who goes to step into the bathtub and they put one foot in and it burns them, what are they going to do? Absolutely. They're going to pull their foot back. They're going to pull right out. They're not going to stick their other foot in and stand in hot water. That just you know defies all logic. Um, and the other thing that we'll see is if they fall in, we're not going to see this uniform injury where you can see where the foot was submerged. Um, if they fall in, there's going to be splash marks and the burns are going to be very ununiform in how they present on the child's body.
And on this last slide, you can see um, the great injury here. So this child was actually um, had their face pressed to some sort of a grate. Um, could have been like a part of a grill or something like that. Um, I, we've even seen um, burn injuries from children being put in the dryer and it turned on um, and the vent on the back will leave kind of um, a waffle pattern on their skin, um, which is so, so awful to think about, but we definitely see these types of injuries. And so you always want to look at the injury and, and listen to the story and say, well, does that make sense? And if your gut is telling you that something isn't right, then you need to take those next steps and report it. Because we, the last thing we want to do is send a child home to a situation that's going to uh, put them um, at greater risk. In addition to what was mentioned before, um, we also want to provide uh, patient and family support. This could be provided through play therapy. We want to do um, an excellent job um, educating um, in preparation for surgery. Many of these kids go for multiple skin grafts and surgeries, and we want to make sure they're prepared for what to expect, how much pain will they be when they wake up, that type of thing. And we also want to take this opportunity to teach parents about, about prevention. Um, there was some kind of lapse in supervision or safety um, somewhere along the way. And so we really want to make sure that um, we do our due diligence and make sure they know how to prevent this type of injury in the future. We also want to reduce stress for the child. This can be done through pre-medicating prior to procedures uh, for pain management, um, allowing the child to choose the order of body parts that we're going to do our burn care um, or dressing changes, um, allowing the child to have adequate rest periods in between, um, in between the dressing changes or you know the areas of the body that we're working with. We'll allow the child to remove the dressings. Um, they're going to be soiled and saturated, so let the child don gloves and be in charge of removing their dressing, and this puts them in charge of how quickly um, the tape is going to be pulled off and can just really help them to be more cooperative. Uh, we can allow them to hold packages and maybe even open packages and drop them on our sterile field if they're old enough to follow directions and be closely supervised. And always, always, always we want to praise the child for their bravery. Even if they cry through the whole procedure or they're really not very cooperative, we want to tell them how proud we are of them and how brave they were and how great a job that they did. Because hopefully that will encourage good behavior um, with future dressing changes and procedures. And that wraps up the voiceover for um, endocrine and skin. Um, the references you can see here, and we'll discuss any of your questions in class.